Hello, I'm Glenn Arnold. I'm a field specialist working in uh, manure nutrient management systems with the Ohio State University Extension. I'm here today to deliver a lecture for Dr. Steve Kuhlman's class. The swine industry is growing in Ohio. If you look at the most recent, recent census that came out, uh, we are up in hog numbers across most of the state. These two buildings are both uh, what we would call a double wide hog finishing building. Each building would hold about 2,450 pigs and underneath those pigs the manure is stored and there would be about at the end of the year about 700,000 gallons collected in each of these buildings. Might be a little bit lower than that or a little bit higher depending on factors that uh, vary from year to year. But again, this is a pretty standard uh, finishing building design in our integrated systems. Dairy industry in Ohio is strong. Uh, financially, they certainly have been hurt, but we have about 270,000 dairy cows in the state. Uh, they produce liquid manure for the most part. And um, because of their system, because of the size of the cattle, uh, they could produce as much as 35 pounds of, uh, or 35 gallons per day of wastewater, and that would be manure, urine, that's also uh, water that's collected from the uh, cooling plates on the milk, uh, from cooling the cattle themselves, outdoor lot runoff, and even leachate from the silos. This would be looking underneath a pig building. This is the pit that uh, the liquid manure is collected in. Uh, this is about 97% water, about 3% solids. And they're typically pumped out once or twice per year, depending on uh, field conditions, depending on uh, weather forecast, how the manure is going to be utilized. For the dairy farms, the vast majority of that manure is stored in outdoor manure ponds. A lot of people use the term lagoon, but it's more accurate in Ohio to say a manure pond because these ponds are generally pumped down and emptied each season. Uh, whereas a true lagoon, you usually just pump off the top four or five feet. But the uh, dairy manure is stored in an outdoor situation. It does collect some rainwater to go along with all the other liquid sources on a dairy farm. And again, this would be something that when it's pumped, it'd be about 97, 98% water and uh, two to three percent solids. Other types of manure in the state uh, would be solid manure. The majority of the beef cattle in Ohio are still on solid manure or straw bedded packs. Um, some are on a, a daily scrape situation and uh, most of the beef manure would be in a solid form in the state. But as we do build additional uh, finishing facilities for cattle, more and more of them are looking at liquid systems as well. So, um, you know, but the majority at this time would be in a solid form. And this is basically just an enclosed manure storage area where pen pack manure can be pushed or scraped on a regular basis until it's time for land application to occur. Poultry litter would be another type of manure that's in the solid form. Uh, this is an older style building where the manure is collected in the pits. In the newer buildings, they're actually collected on small conveyor belts, belts and augered out to a uh, large storage building. But again, poultry litter generally is a solid type of manure in the state of Ohio. This is uh, typical of the pumping systems that we use in the state. Uh, this pump has um, got about a 12 inch line feeding into it from the pond to the right. And then from this pump, it will travel through what we call a main line. Usually those are black in color, but a main line out to the field where it's going to be land applied. This is a picture of a main line that's going out through. Uh, that could be anywhere from one to five miles, depending on how far the field is going to be away. And uh, once you get beyond about a mile to maybe two, usually we have to put pumps in the uh, hoses. Uh, to uh, boost the uh, overall pressure and volume. So these uh, are great ways to move manure, great distances uh, in a very timely manner. And then when it does reach the field, the orange hose that you see connected to this manure applicator would be the actual drag hose itself. This orange hose is much more expensive per foot than the mainline black hose that we saw but they're very strong. You can pull these across fields. Uh, they'll stretch out quite a, fall, quite a bit and then they'll um, deliver the manure to the applicator and then 
Once it reaches the applicator, you can see in the picture, then that manure will be distributed to each of those injectors. And this is a, looks like about a 30-foot toolbar injecting, uh, looks like dairy manure, into soybean stubble in the fall. So every 30 inches, you can see where an injector is going through and subsurface applying dairy manure. Manure is also transported in semi-tankers and, and manure tankers. On the right is a semi-tanker that's pulled into a wheat stubble field. On the left is a manure application tanker, and it's siphoning the manure out of the semi. And then this uh, red tanker on the left side will then do the land application uh, from here, and the semi will run back and get another load of manure during the application process. So. We usually can uh, efficiently move manure with semi-tankers um, certain distances and then drag hoses for some distances, but there's many, many ways to uh, move manure in the state of Ohio. Well, this is just a picture of a farmer's auto steer system. Um, we've come a long way in agriculture in the last 15 years with these auto steers. Um, in this situation, the farmer turns the tractor on the end, heads down through the field. He can push a button, and that will lock the tractor in to drive in a straight line uh, all the way to the other end of the field. This picture you see of the yellow is parts of the field that has already been covered, and the tractor is following this white line, the AB line we call that, uh, down through the field. And we can be very precise with our application. We don't have skips and misses, misses this way. And uh, it's just kind of reflects uh, how agriculture is uh, changing, getting more technical, getting more specialized. And this is kind of a picture of what manure application would have been when I was a, a youngster. Um, you know, the goal here is just to get the manure out of the barn, into the field, not necessarily to apply evenly, not necessarily to uh, uh, maximize use of the nutrients. When I worked with farmers uh, several years ago, I uh, surveyed them when they would attend meetings and asked them uh, what three month period of time represents when the majority of your manure is applied. And so the farmers and the commercial manure applicators who responded at the meetings, you can see from January to March, they said about 3% of their application takes place. April to June is about 19%. July to September was 29%. And October to December was fully 49%, or nearly half of all of our manure in Western Ohio is applied in the fall. That puts us under you know, conditions that uh, you know, we've put all our eggs in a basket here. And if we don't get adequate weather, if it's too, too wet during that application period, or if crops are delayed in coming off due to uh, delayed harvest conditions, then we really put ourselves in a bind. Also, by putting a lot of manure out in the fall, we've missed the opportunity to utilize some of those manure nutrients as fully as we could. So a lot of my research is to try to move more of this October to December applied manure into that um, April to June time period. And these manure application windows are dictated by your growing crops. Just a few years ago, once a field of corn was planted, uh, we would never ever consider putting a manure applicator out there in that field. And uh, the only person allowed out there was basically whoever applied the herbicides to the field or whoever side dressed the corn crop with uh, um, liquid nitrogen or 28% or, or anhydrous. Wheat acreage continues to decline in the state. Uh, that's been a, a steady decline for many, many years. And again, that's a window of summertime when crops, you know, wheat crop is harvested in early July that we would typically have to apply manure, that we're losing that. Fall application season usually starts when harvest starts with the dairy farms. And then I have a statement here that we need to open ad additional windows for manure application. Uh, get us more days of the year that we can apply and not have uh, so much uh, focus on the fall application season. So in the state of Ohio, in response to the algae issues and stuff, uh, we've really worked with the 4R program for uh, commercial fertilizers, and that is the right nutrient at the right place, the right time, and the right amount. Um, timing and placement are areas that we most need to address in the manure portion, I believe, 
and uh, placement is underground, of course, and timing is when more of the nutrients can be utilized by growing crops or cover crops if it has to be. This is a picture of Lake Erie and uh, one of the bad years that we had with algae issues. The western Lake Erie Basin is the extreme left side of Lake Erie. That's where most of the algae issues began. And in this picture, you can see where the algae has gone all the way over to the Cleveland area along the southern part of Lake Erie. So again, we want to get the algae under control as best we can. This is a picture of the western Lake Erie Basin watershed. Uh, Toledo is up at the top of that in um, uh, Lucas County. And um, this is a large watershed. This encom encompasses more than 3 million acres. Uh, if you think of Ohio as having 88 separate counties in the state, uh, I think this watershed touches 26 of those 88. And then on the bottom left side <coughs> is uh, just a rectangle that represents Grand Lake St. Mary's. And that's a, a smaller body of water. That's a smaller watershed, about 47,000 acres in that watershed. So when you um, when you look at the work that it put in the Grand Lake St. Mary's, you can imagine how much additional work it's going to take uh, to get the Western Lake Erie Basin watershed um, to uh, uh, produce less phosphorus into Lake Erie. This is kind of a typical. Uh, manure tests. You can send manure in to be analyzed just like you can send soil in for a soil test. And this happens to be a liquid uh, system from a swine finishing building. And I just want to walk you through a few numbers with this. Number one, the, when we report liquid manure, we report it in pounds of nutrients per 1,000 gallons of manure. The second item I would point out in the middle row, I don't have it circled here, but the moisture of this sample is 97.24% water. So very little solids in these liquid manures. The next item I look at when I look at uh, uh, manure tests are um, how much total nitrogen. And the arrow is pointing to the total nitrogen number of 37.68 pounds of total nitrogen in 1,000 gallons of the swine finishing manure. If we look at what makes up the total nitrogen, ammonium nitrogen is by far the biggest component. In this example, we have 35.97 pounds of nitrogen in the uh, of the 37.68 total pounds of nitrogen. So it's almost all in the ammonium form. The next line is empty, but that's nitrate nitrogen. That's usually pretty low in liquid manures. And the third line down under the nitrogens are the organic nitrogen. And in this sample, in every 1,000 gallons, there's only 1.72 pounds of organic nitrogen. That's pretty low. If this were a dairy manure sample, uh, that would be higher because of the fiber that's in the dairy systems when they feed them. But with uh, monogastrics like pigs, uh, most of the, ammoni or the uh, nitrogen is in the ammonium form. And a lot of that is because as the manure travels down through the slats in the hog building, it falls into water and ammonia is easily absorbed by water. So that water will capture the vast majority of the ammonium in the urine and the feces. And that's how we get these numbers. The other numbers you always look at in manure are things like phosphorus. This is P2O5 at 12.36 pounds in 1,000 gallons. More common to see about 20 in a sample, but that's what this farmer has run for a number of years. And then the other number we look at is K2O, uh, potassium. And basically this farmer has 29.87 pounds of K2O in a thousand gallons. So it kind of gives you an idea of what the actual nutrients that you would be carrying in a tanker or pumping through a drag hose when it's going to a field. If you look at current values, nitrogen is probably around 45 cents a pound. Um, P2O5 is probably closer to 50 cents a pound. And then uh, K2O is probably closer to perhaps 30 cents a pound in the markets as they are right now today. The other nutrients that we have down th through here are a host of micronutrients uh, from calcium to uh, boron to zinc. The one that I would point out here is the uh, sulfur because a lot of our soil tests call for sulfur in our uh, farm fields. And if you are a manure application, 
uh, person, then you're putting sulfur in the soil, which again, another nutrient that you wouldn't have to buy. And the last point I'll make with uh, these manure tests, when you're dealing with swine manure especially, if uh, I'm standing beside a uh, double white hog building and they've got 700,000 gallons in the, in the pit, it's completely full, um, you could argue that of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash value of that manure, the ammonium nitrogen's about 40% of that value. So that's a pretty large number that um, we, if we can figure out ways to capture that, uh, we can make a lot more value out of that livestock manure. <coughs> a few years ago, we started doing research plots with manure on crops. So we started with wheat, used a terrigator with a Wienheinz toolbar, which some people would call a grassland applicator toolbar. And we also um, used a uh, noon tanker with, you can see the tractor on the front, and what we called a pecan toolbar. And it has a similar design, similar uh, openings to a uh, Wienheinz toolbar. And we essentially applied manure. Uh, we did surface application on wheat. We did um, incorporation on the right on wheat, and then we compared those with urea on the left-hand side of this picture. And even though I'm driving between the wheat plants with this toolbar, trust me, we drove across quite a bit of the wheat as well. So occasionally you would slice some wheat plants in half using the injection toolbar. But if you look at the data over the three years that we did the wheat plots, uh, from 2007 to 2009, the gold bars in this graph are the uh, surface applied swine manure. The red bars are the incorporated swine manure. And the gray bars are the surface applied urea. And if you look at each of the three years, generally there wasn't a lot of difference. The first year there was a statistical advantage for the uh, surface applied manure over the other two application methods. But in the other two years, they were just pretty similar. And it just shows the variability you can get with growing wheat. That's one of the reasons why some farmers frown upon it. But when we had the phenomenal 2009 wheat growing year around here, uh, you can see the manure and the 28 uh, were pretty much head to head and uh, looked pretty good across there. So this research told us that manure is a pretty good substitute for buying commercial urea if we want to top dress wheat. But you just have to make sure you put the right amount on. And some other ways we've used liquid manure with wheat. Uh, this wheat was planted and then the liquid manure applicator came in and applied the manure on top of the newly planted wheat. And you can see from this picture how the uh, applicator made the turn on the end and how the uh, manure um, provided additional nitrogen for the wheat and additional moisture for the wheat and enabled it to, um, to grow nicely. So again, uh, putting manure on top of newly planted wheat is another window of time that we can apply manure. 
And in this picture, this is a farmer sent us in from Indiana. Uh, this was a field of wheat. It was a dry November. So before he planted his wheat, uh, he had injected dairy manure using the Dragos applicator. And you can see uh, where the moisture and the nitrogen from the manure has enabled his wheat to grow uh, much more rapidly. And again, so um, in this instance, it was probably more the moisture than anything that really gave that weed an opportunity to, uh, to excel in the fall. Now, in addition to the wheat work, we also have done a lot of work on getting uh, manure to be used as side dress for corn. This is our university small plot tanker. Uh, these are some of the early plots where we would side dress corn with liquid swine manure and compare that to 28% uh, uh, urea ammonium nitrate. And at the same time, we also have done. And this is some of our small plot research. In this thing, in this this uh, slide, the top half are pre-emergent plots. When we started this research, I thought that corn would not be able to be emerged to handle the drag hose, so we were looking at a pretty narrow three or four week window of early planted corn when you could actually get in and use a drag hose. So these pre-emergent plots, the top half of this slide, uh, just talks about the treatments. One was the first one was incorporated 28% UAN at 200 pounds per acre. Then the next treatment was incorporated swine manure at 5,000 gallons per acre. Then we had surface applied swine manure at 5,000 gallons per acre. Then we went with incorporated dairy manure at 13,500 gallons per acre and surface applied dairy manure in the next treatment. Now, neither of those um, dairy manure treatments would have 200 units of total nitrogen. So we had to add about 40 pounds, 45 pounds of uh, um, commercial fertilizer, uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre to reach our 200 pound goal. But the top half, again, are the pre-emergent treatments. The bottom half of this slide are the post-emergent treatments. And essentially the same treatments, only we waited until the corn was at the V3 stage of growth. And at the very bottom, you can see a zero nitrogen check. As you follow across, you can see these were done in 2012, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And then on the far right side is a five-year average. So the five-year average for incorporated 28% UAN was 142.6 bushels per acre. And again, we had about three dry years of the five, so it was pretty, pretty tough sledding at times. But if you look at the incorporated swine manure right below that, uh, you get a situation of, of where we were pleasantly surprised that we had nice improvements. And if you look at the post-emergent plots, they were similar. So in our, in our uh, commercial fertilizer versus incorporated swine manure, the incorporated swine manure was 15 to 18 bushels better uh, than the commercial fertilizer over a five-year period of time. When we surface applied that same amount of manure, uh, we gave back the advantage and we're, we're, um, it just shows that if you're gonna leave nitrogen on top of the ground, you're gonna to have to expect to lose quite a bit of it. So which, and that's what we did. So we're, our uh, yields dropped back down uh, on those surface applied manure, but at least we had some data. So we know what's uh, occurring out there. Also in this slide, if you go down a little further on each of those treatments and you look at the incorporation Incorporated dairy manure, uh, you will see the incorporated dairy manure was very, very similar to incorporated swine manure. And I think, again, when you're incorporating moisture into the ground and covering it up with nitrogen, uh, you're just providing a nice place for those corn roots to find and pull in the nutrients that they want. So just emphasize that um, there's a lot of good ways to use manure. And this set of data just kind of tells us that there's opportunities here for manure to be used as a side dress source of nitrogen for growing corn.
The next step after the tanker work was to um, to make the drag hose work out properly. Uh, if this were a square field and a drag drag hose operator was going to apply manure, he would want to lay his hose the longest way across the field for the first pull. So that would be one corner to the opposite corner on this. And you can see the lines on this graph. And essentially, they would divide the field into two triangles. And they would do the bottom triangle first. And they would do what's called a bow tie maneuver. And then they would do the other half of the field with the drag hose. And if, uh, if a commercial applicator can set up in this fashion, then he or she could, and could uh, side dress the entire field without having to have a second tractor, uh, a hose humper, or anybody else working that hose in the situation. At harvest time, the herds let us ride along in the down with our tanker work. If you look at these four years of data, and we now have seven years, but this was the first four years that we had collected side-by-side -side data. Um, over the four years, he's averaged 186.3 bushels per acre with the uh, swine manure, and then he leaves strips of... Um, the field where we can apply the 28% UAN at a similar nitrogen rate, and those strips have averaged 171.5 bushels per acre. That's about a 14.8 bushel difference, and in my research plots, I was between 15 and 18 bushels better with the liquid manure, so I feel pretty comfortable with these numbers. And as the years have gone on, they've gotten better with their application techniques and are, are uh, reaping the benefits from that. But for this time period, if they did not have to buy the commercial side dress nitrogen they typically purchase, they felt that they would save $75 an acre on nitrogen. And then if they looked at the yield advantage they had gotten over that four-year period of time and the price of corn that they would average over that time period, they felt they were about $125.32 to the better by using the manure as a side dress. And they, they would simply do this every other year in a corn bean side uh, rotation. If you look at the balance that would be involved in that, this is um, how we have calculated that. If you look at the corn crop, and if you average a 200 bushel corn crop, which they're in pretty close to doing that in their seventh year average, um, they would remove 0.35 pounds of P2O5 for every bushel of corn removed. And they would remove 0.2 pounds of K2O for every bushel removed. So if you look at the P2O5, that would re remove 70 pounds with the 200 bushel corn crop. And in the K2O column, you would remove 40 pounds of K2O for the 200 bushels removed. In the next line down, we have soybeans at 65 bushels per acre. Soybeans remove 0.79 pounds of P2O5 per bushel and 1.14 pounds of P2O or K2O per bushel. So coming across to the right under the P2O5 column, uh, we're looking at 51 pounds removed by the soybean crop. If you look at the K2O column, that's 74 pounds removed. So the removal, the two-year summary, is 121 pounds of P2O5 and 114 pounds of K2O. When the Herods side dress their corn every two years with 6,500 gallons of their swain manure based on their analysis, they're putting on about 221 pounds of nitrogen, and they're also applying 117 pounds of P2O5 and 143 pounds of K2O. So if you look at that over a two-year period of time, your net nutrient gain is pretty minimal. It's a negative 4 on the P2O5, and it's a plus 29 on the K2O. So you would not expect their soil test values to move very much at all uh, in this type of a rotation. So that's another thing that they're really emphasizing is that you're putting this liquid manure on in a time when you can capture the nitrogen with the corn crop and it looks like you're a pretty close balance for what we would want in these nutrients. 
You can see I've got those circled at the bottom. Now, in addition to knifing manure into corn, we have uh, a lot of people who have been surface applying liquid. When we look at how tall a corn can be with a drag hose, that's always the question that we had early on when we started this research. And here's a video. of one of our research plots at Ohio State. You can see we have a six inch drag hose filled with water that we're pulling across corn. And we do this uh, every year, we did for five years, where we flatten corn with this drag hose at the stages V1. And we can also tell you by looking at this picture that when you do snap corn off, which we have here, this is V5 corn. Uh, V5 is too tall to drag a, a drag hose across. So I just wanted to show you, uh, we can be pretty tough on these cornfields or these plots when we do them. But I'd also point out that the corn on both the right and the left was also flattened at one time, and it's standing up pretty nicely. But at V5, we know that's uh, more of, an, more of a, a problem than, uh, than a solution. But this is the data from um, five years of doing this drag hose work. Uh, this was done at OERDC at Hoytville with uh, Matt Davis and his crew. Um, on the top, um, we've got the dates, uh, 2014 through 2018. Down the left-hand column, we've got the stages of the corn from no drag hose at all, which would have been our control, to uh, stages V1 through V5. And then as we come across to, on the right-hand side and we look, uh, we can see the averages here. And... Um, the big thing I guess I would point out that over the five year period of time uh, on the no drag hose, we average pretty close to 170 bushels per acre. If we look at the V1 row following that across, we average pretty close to 170 bushels per acre. If we follow the V2 row across, again, we're about a little below 170 bushels per acre. But on the V3 row, we're slightly above 170 bushels per acre. And that's a variability you would always expect in a plot. At V4, looks like we may be taking our first indication of maybe a yield reduction. And at V5, you can see our yield is 122.9. So we're almost 50 bushels below what all the other ones were. So based on that, we feel pretty comfortable that we can we can side dress corn through the v4 stage but not beyond that we do not want the corn in the v5 stage another way of doing that is you can kind of walk out to a corn field uh, if you can step on the, the stalk push it over with your foot if it snaps off it's probably going to be too tall for what we wanted to do with the drag hose but as we talk about these stages of corn the first leaf that comes out of the ground on the corn is rounded, like the end of your thumb. That is the V1 in this picture. Um, on the left-hand side is the V2 leaf. And as that follow comes into the stalk, it has a collar where it grips the plant. The next leaf up is labeled at V3. Again, that has a collar where it's gripping the plant, much like you would grip a hose, or I should say you should grip a, a hoe or a shovel. Uh, similar to how this leaf grips that plant. The upper two leaves are not yet developed far enough to develop to have collars. 
So those would be eventually uh, V4 and V5, but they are they are not developed far enough to be counted. So this is kind of the ideal sweet spot I consider for using a drag hose on corn to make it uh, successful. And that's kind of the point where the Herods have aimed for a number of years. Ohio State has three side dress toolbars that we try to work with farmers around the state, encouraging them to uh, look at this practice. We can provide the toolbar and the tractor thanks to grants and thanks to a lot of help from uh, commodity groups in the state, from in independent uh, livestock uh, operators, and uh, we appreciate all their help over the years. A couple things I want to emphasize on using drag hoses on corn. If the fields are, are mellow, if they were loamy soils that were worked in the spring, they can sometimes be too soft for a drag hose. Again, these hoses are not light. They're six, six inches in diameter or so, um, full of water. That's a lot of pounds per foot of length. And this is an example of where corn is being buried by the loose dirt that the drag hose is scouring. And even though this field yielded very nicely and a farmer was happy in the end, initially it looked pretty concerning that we were burying that type of um, corn with a hose. We'd like to see that corn uh, look pretty good once the hose went across it. And I think here's another example of a loamy soil uh, where surface applying manure. What is our goal? Well, we want to use liquid manure to fertilize growing crops as another toolbar, and a tool in the toolbox, another window in the year to apply manure to farm fields. So now we have got a situation where we've probably got about a full month after corn's been planted to still get manure on those corn fields. We think capturing nitrogen uh, that's typically been wasted since we evolved to a liquid sy system years ago is a nice goal to have. Again, uh, before we never had liquid nitrogen to capture back when we were bedded pack with everything, but now today we've got a lot more liquid nitrogen we can take advantage of in this corn. And we think we're wanting to integrate liquid manure into modern crop production. And if we can do that, then we'll be putting the right nutrient in the right place, in the right time, in the right amount. And that's been one of our research goals with Ohio State for a number of years. If you like to follow up on this type of thing, um, I have a university Facebook page. It's called Ohio State Environmental and Manure Management. Uh, if you want, want to, to like that, then you can uh, follow me. And uh, I've got about oh, a little over 2,000 who are following. And it's been a nice method to promote this. So I have uh, producers from Canada and from many other states in the United States uh, encourage uh, uh, showing me pictures, sending me videos, letting me see how successful they are with this practice. And with that, I'm going to conclude the lecture today. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to present some of my research data, and hopefully you do well on Dr. Kuhlman's class. Thank you. see 
as the host follows a commercial manure applicator across the field, we're scouring a lot more dirt than we want. So that dirt is being redeposited in lower parts of the field. And then again, even the liquid manure is being shoved around on the surface. So this is an example of where a field is a bit too soft for a drag hose to function effectively, or at least the way we would want. So we encourage uh, uh, this type of work to be done on um, no-till fields, on uh, fields with cover crops, minimum tillage, or even a field like this, had it received a pounding rain to firm up the soil, would probably be a good candidate for, for drag hosing. One. V2, V3, V4, and V5. And we don't just flatten it once. We turn right around and go back over to the top of this corn immediately uh, so that all plots were dragged twice to tr try to maximize the damage. And we drag them in the morning when the corn will be the most brittle and rigid so that if they were going to snap off or be damaged, that'd be the most likely time. Corn crops, and they can do this from the day the corn's planted up until the corn reaches about that V3 to V4 stage. And this would just be an example of a farmer that uh, planted the corn, the corn has emerged, fields are pretty firm, so the drag hose person is coming across and simply surface applying liquid manure on emerged corn. And we've done this for quite a few years now in Ohio, and even though I personally would prefer to see the manure incorporated, um, this does provide a real boost to the corn, allows it to take off and grow a little faster. You're applying the nutrients to a growing crop, so you're going to capture quite a bit of this nitrogen applied this way. Combines. This was part of the field that was a, was side dressed with uh, liquid manure, and you can see uh, the corn is standing nicely. The weed control, which was one of our concerns, has been excellent each year. There's not really been any additional weed pressure from using the swine manure in this manner, and he's found similar results with his side dress efforts that we. go to a drag hose. And this is Herod Farms. It'll be Tom and Corey Herod in Dark County, Ohio. And they were the first farmers to start doing side dress plots with us as researchers. So this is a VTI toolbar that they are simply going across a no-till field and they're incorporating liquid swine manure directly in between the corn rows, just as you would side dress with anhydrous ammonia or 28% UAN. You can see how that hose drags right through the growing corn. And we've worked with them now for a number of years with this. quite a few field plots with farmers where we've gone in and done uh, quarter mile fields and we essentially would do 12 rows of swine manure, 12 rows of commercial fertilizer, 12 rows of sw swine manure and fertilizer and we would replicate those four times across the field. 
And again, our goal was to find out uh, how manure would perform as a replacement um, fertilizer for commercial fertilizer. Here's a video of wheat being top dressed about April 1st in Putnam County. And when I talk about using the right amount, if you over apply nitrogen to wheat, then that wheat will go down before harvest. And it's you know not much fun to harvest wheat that's laying on the ground because there was too much nitrogen, it grew too tall, and then it fell over. So when we look at uh, replacing purchased nitrogen with um, Livestock manure, we try to go aim for similar amounts of nitrogen. In most of our plots, we try to run around 3,500 pounds of finishing manure, and that will give us about 115 to 120 units of nitrogen. And that's about what we applied with the urea as well. So this is just an example of a wheat field being covered with a drag hose. And the hose drags nicely across the top of the wheat plants. In Ohio, of course, with a non-frozen non ground like this. We'd want to stay 35 feet away from the edge of the field because this is a vegetated field. Uh, if it were a non-vegetated field, setback would be, a, be a 100 feet. And then in the wintertime, uh, we don't encourage frozen ground application of manure. But if you had the growing crop, then uh, 200 feet is a recommended setback. So again, you can see the drag hose crawling across the field, uh, supplying manure to the toolbar. 